morning, everyone. Happy Mother's Day. How many mothers do we have in here today? Awesome. Well, happy Mother's Day. I hope you guys feel so celebrated today. Uh, Tori is actually out of town for a bachelorette trip with my fiance. And so you have Jerry and I leading worship today. Um, this is our bachelor party. This is, this is our <laughs> bachelor party. I love it. <laughs> Uh, Yeah, so let's pray together before we begin our time of worship. Jesus, we welcome you here, here this morning. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place. Will you soften our hearts to receive what you have in store for this morning? I thank you in advance for everything you're going to do. We just want to spend time with you. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name I pray. Amen. Do it only you can do. With one word, the mountains move. When you breathe, the dead arise, and the bones come back to life. There is power in this room Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is life Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom Like a river running wild Like a never-ending fire Where the Spirit of the Lord It's your name that tears down walls. Every enemy will fall. So we will stand and we will fight. That every wrong would be made right. There is power in this room. Oh, we believe with the Spirit of the Lord. this morning is an older song. It was actually a hymn that was written in the late 1800s. But I I want to share it with you this morning because uh, my mother, who has already passed on to glory, spent her life teaching Sunday school. 
I remember that more so than any other uh, thing that she did in her life. She was always, first and foremost, a Sunday school teacher and kind of um, learned a lot from that example. I learned a lot from that example being one that um, how important it is for us to understand the way of salvation, for us to really be able to embrace the good news and, and what the good news of Jesus Christ is all about. This song uh, just does such a wonderful job of very simply and very uh, concisely sharing the good news. Listen to these words. Saved me, 
Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, glorious day. Glorious day. What a glorious day. so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness.
good morning. Happy Mother's Day again. We're glad you're here to worship with us at Hillsdale and uh, join us this Mother's Day to celebrate. We, we have gifts for all the ladies who are here today in attendance. Guys, your day's coming. You're gonna, it's not quite as powerful as Mother's Day, is it? But Mother's Day, we celebrate our mothers and we're glad for all of the ladies who are here in attendance. As you exit today, uh, we have a gift for you. Christy put these together on the tables as you're going through the doors. Uh, we celebrate those of you who are joining us live stream today. Uh, we'll have a gift for you as well if you want to swing by the church sometime and pick that up uh, as part of Mother's Day. We are um, wrapping up. We're, we're not wrapping up. Tori's going to uh, bring us a message next week uh, specifically about life groups and how that ministry works here at Hillsdale. Uh, but we've, we've been talking about for the last few weeks this Hillsdale 2.0, this notion of living out our core beliefs, living out our core practices uh, as a, a place of faith and practice and understanding a church. We are a church, and so uh, we're, we're going to talk about that some more today. Um, I do want to share with you that um, as far as announcements go, uh, we are so glad that we will soon be uh, worshiping at different hours. We're going to be worshiping at 9 and 1030 on June the 6th, starting June the 6th and going forward. We're going to bring all the chairs back into the sanctuary. Uh, we're going to uh, bring our coffee makers back. Yay, God. I thought for sure that would get a standing ovation or something. But our coffee makers are coming back and our Danishes are coming back, and we're going to be safe, and we're going to protect everyone with that and still follow rules and things like that. But we hope and we pray that things are opening up just a little bit with that as time goes on. But I think that's our big announcement going forward. Uh, I will say, announcement-wise, that we were talking about having graduation Sunday on June the 6th at that uh, first um, Sunday in June we're going to that day we're going to be out on the hill and we're going to celebrate baptisms but I uh, understand we learned after we made that announcement that graduation is actually on June the 5th so if they if the kids graduate on June the 5th and we recognize them on June the 6th I expect they will all be at Myrtle Beach <laughs> when we're trying to recognize them so we're going to contact families and see when the best time to do that uh, we do want to recognize all of our graduates, though, for the hard work they've put in this year, and we will do that for both high school and college sometime soon. Just uh, be on the lookout for that announcement. Okay, for today's message, as we continue on with this core belief, uh, I want to uh, read a passage of Scripture from the book of Romans. And I've picked a different Bible, a different translation for this reading today. Now the words, I appreciate the words in this translation a little more, uh, and uh, so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Romans. This is Paul's last letter to the church uh, before he is, he is killed. He is in prison, and Paul ha gives his life for the sake of the gospel. He, he did not intend to die at this point. He had intention to move on to Spain. Spain was his next target to plant a church, but um, the, the authorities grabbed a hold of him and he was executed around 65 to 68 AD. Right before that uh, happened, he was in prison and he wrote this letter, the book of Romans was a letter that he wrote right before his death. Now the good, the good thing for us is that Paul has had plenty of time, you know this man did incredible things uh, to share the gospel. He planted so many churches. He was so resilient and so, he, he had energy that I cannot fathom. Uh, but um, what Romans represents is really um, a summary, a systematic theology, Paul's understanding of who Jesus is, who God is to us, and who we are in that relationship. So when we talk about kind of systematic things, he he lays it out for us and gives us such a, an incredible tool to use to share with one another. Listen to what Paul says 
in Romans 15. Just going to read a few verses here. Um, Each of us, Paul says, must please our neighbor for the good purpose of building up, you're probably going to be surprised at this, the neighbor. Let me read that again. Each of us must please our neighbor for the good purpose of building up the neighbor. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. Now let me just stop right there for a second. When he's talking about scripture and he's talking about writings, he's talking about the Old Testament. When Paul wrote his letters to us in 50 and 60 AD, there was no New Testament. Matter of fact, his letters became the very first documents that began to circulate within the Christian community as systematic theology, as an understanding. And then later, Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, they wrote the Gospels, but that came after Paul's writing. So there is no New Testament, but he says, for whatever was written in former days, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another. Such a key, such a key um, voice. Live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I like this last sentence. And I like the way this translation puts it. Welcome one another. Therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O God. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So let me just take you a little bit to the setting of what Paul was dealing with when he wrote this letter in prison uh, to the house churches in Rome. There were no churches. There were no buildings. The temple had been destroyed, even if it were available, but it wasn't available. There were Jewish synagogues that were scattered out uh, in this period of time, but this was something new. And so what developed in the early days of Christianity um, were house churches. People would meet in homes or they would meet in the uh, basement or sometimes they would need to hide. They would be in the woods even, but they would come together primarily, especially in Rome, in homes and Paul was writing this letter to all of those homes that were scattered out throughout Rome. Now it may be surprising to you it, it, or it may not be surprising to you that the church even from day one was fragmented and Paul was trying to speak to this and these, this scripture that I read to you today is very much speaking to the division that existed. Because here's what was happening in those early days. There were Jewish Christian house meetings and there were Gentile Christian house meetings. And they were all throughout the area. Everywhere Paul went, he, he planted churches and he welcomed the Gentiles and he encouraged his brothers and sisters in his own ethnicity to accept and embrace and understand that there's no longer Jew or Greek or Gentile. It's, it's all one. But we as human beings do what we do best. We fracture, we divide up, we take our separate. We'd rather meet with our people. So the Jewish Christians would meet 
and the Gentile Christians would meet, would meet. And so Paul was speaking, uh, he, he gave us a fit. He, throughout his letters, 1 Corinthians is probably the most brazen one, but there are other places where he just fusses. Now he has reached a point in his ministry where he's kind of putting the fussing aside and he's saying, look, let's do this together. The point is we need to be one voice. We need to be in harmony with one another for the glory of God. And for who? For our neighbor. And for us, certainly for us. You know, the, the point that Paul's trying to make to us in this passage and into the book of Romans is that we have a witness, church. We have a witness. And the witness is to those who don't know those who don't understand. Now, that witness rubs off on us. It's to us as well, but primarily it's about our neighbor. And you remember, now Jesus gave that beautiful parable of the Good Samaritan when, when the, uh, the lawyer said, just exactly who is my neighbor? So here Paul is building on that notion. The point is, be good. You have a purpose with your neighbor, to please your neighbor. So that's where we're kind of grounding it. Now I want to step back before we kind of get into our practices that embrace uh, how we minister to our neighbors. I want to speak a little bit about baptism because last week I didn't quite have enough time to unpack that second sacrament. And we're doing that in a couple weeks. We're celebrating baptism uh, on the hill on June the 6th. And so I welcome you. I welcome you to come and be baptized. I welcome you as well to come and reaffirm your baptism. And I'll say a little bit later what that is all about. We believe in this holy, sacred sacrament of baptism, just like we did with, you know, we kind of spent a little bit more time on the Lord's Supper. But as a church, we embrace and we minister with two sacraments, the Lord's Supper and the sacrament of baptism. So baptism for us is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. And it signifies for us a gateway, a front door, if you will, into the household of the kingdom of God. It is our initiation into the household of the kingdom of God. It also signifies for us a holy mystery, something that is otherworldly. You might call it mystical or supernatural, but for me, baptism, as with the Lord's Supper, is very kind of mysterious. Because the power that comes through this sacrament is the power of Jesus Christ, the power of God to make a direct and, and substantial impact on our life, bringing us into the kingdom of God, initiating us into that faith. So we, we get this from Jesus and Jesus told us to do these things. Go into the world, baptizing in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. We better baptize in that name when we baptize somebody. I don't baptize somebody and say, I baptize you in the name of Jesus. I guess I could, but more directly, I'm responding to what Jesus said to do. Baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And as we shared a couple of weeks ago, that's what I believe God's name is. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we baptize in the name of God. And the, the mystical part about that, do you remember when Jesus came to John in the Gospels and he, and he said, I want to be baptized? And John was like, what? You, know, you don't need to be baptized. You need to be baptizing me. See, what was happening in John's day with baptism is the people believed that baptism washed away and made them clean, and took away their sin, and everybody needs to repent and be washed away of their sin. And Jesus said, nope, this is going to be something different. 
and he, he demonstrated for everybody in front of him how it was different. His baptism. Baptism at that point that Jesus taught us what it means to be baptized, baptized is a baptism of fire. It's a baptism of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. We believe as Christian people that God's Holy Spirit is imparted to us, not by anything that I do. I'm not powerful enough to do that. John knew that he wasn't powerful enough to do that. The heavens opened up. The Spirit of the living God descended upon Jesus and gave Jesus what he needed at that point in his human life to carry out his ministry. You remember that happened right before he went into the wilderness, right before he started his three years of ministry, miracles, all that he did for us, all that he taught us. He just literally shows up on the scene and said, this is important. This is a gateway. This is the front door. So that's what we believe. I believe when you are baptized, you receive the Holy Spirit. Now we we don't believe in baptizing people more than once because here's the, here's the holy mystery and the supernaturalness of it all. God does the work. God imparts the Holy Spirit upon you and you better believe that what God does is perfect in you. People will come to me occasionally and they'll say, Ooh, pastor, you don't know how dirty I am. I was baptized, I think I was 12, 13 years old, but I have been down some nasty roads since. I need to be baptized again. And you know what the first thing I say to them? You do not need to be baptized again because God did not mess up. You messed up. You've taken a crooked path. God did not. And God's spirit is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and it lives in you. You may want to reaffirm your baptism. Here's what I do often when I encourage people to reaffirm their baptism. And by the way, this works very well for those of you who are parents and your, your young teen or elementary school, your young child wants to be baptized. Here's a good thing you can do. I'll go with you. I'll go with you into the water with Pastor Jerry. And the only difference between one's reaffirmation and being baptized for the first time is my question to you and your response. Have you been baptized before? Nope. If somebody says to me, I can't remember, then we're going to baptize you. But here's what I will say to even that. This is God's work. And if you don't quite remember, God remembers. Here's something that we do at Hillsdale um, that... By the way, before you turn me off, <laughs> before you flip the switch, the church has been doing this since day one. We baptize children. We baptize infants. And we do that because we believe baptism is the work of God. Our work, by the way, is professing our faith. I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I put my entire confidence and trust in his saving grace. And I desire to live the rest of my life in service and commitment to Jesus. That's a profession of faith. And that has to come from your lips. Can't come from the pastor's lips. Can't come from your grandmother's lips. Has to come from your lips. So baptism is God imparting God's spirit into your life. Profession of faith is what you do. So we believe that the atonement of Jesus Christ is sufficient for the children, and we encourage the children to come. Now, if you don't believe in that, it's okay. We will celebrate your baptism any way you want to. But I will say to you, when I take somebody down into the water, if they've told me they've never been baptized, I put them under the water, I say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, just as Jesus taught us, told us, instructed us. And I say, may the Holy Spirit work with you all of your days. If you say to me, yes, I have been baptized, Pastor, I'll look you in the eyes 
And I will say, remember your baptism and be grateful. And then I'll put you under the water and I will lift you out of the water and I will say, may the Holy Spirit be with you all of your days. So, you see, what we're really saying is we're not going to uh, renounce or minimize or take away from the value of God's work that's already been done in you. Here's what we get to in the church sometimes. And you may have heard this. Some of you have gone down this path with me. Um, the, the pastor did it wrong. Or the pastor was living in sin when he baptized, he or she baptized me. Or the church that I was going to didn't know what they were doing. The church I'm going to now does know what they're doing. Let me just say, God's bigger than all that. That's why it is God's work. And you know what we do with those children when we baptize them and they have yet to come to a full profession of their faith? We say, they are now ours. They are our responsibility. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that this child, surrounded by love and steadfast faith, will be raised and nurtured in the faith until he or she comes to profess for themselves. Listen, the church has been doing that from day one. Read your Bible and challenge me if you want to. We'll, I'll gladly discuss it with you. But I will also say it's okay if you want to wait, if you want to wait for your children to reach a certain age where they do both of these things together. Baptism is the outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace that is the gateway of the kingdom of God. All right, so those are our two sacraments, the Lord's Supper and the sacrament of baptism. Let's talk a little bit about what Paul wrote in this passage of Romans. And, and I want to kind of circle these. This is what we do uh, several years ago. Uh, one of our bishops out in Missouri wrote this book, and it was a very fine book. It's called The Five Fruitful Practices of a Vibrant and Healthy Congregation. And so we, as a staff, we got this book and we went through it. And what we recognized was, boy, this, we, we can learn a lot from this, but we're already doing some of these things, and it resonated with us how important they were. The five fruitful practices that we developed several years ago as a congregation, radical hospitality, passionate worship, intentional faith development, risk-taking mission and service, and extravagant generosity. Radical hospitality. The coffee makers are coming back. <laughs> the Danishes are coming back. You know what's radical about it? Over the years, we've had those forever. And we are so intentional about being radically hospitable. I've had leaders tell me, Pastor, why don't you just put out a basket and start taking up some money? It would help us offset this annual expense with, with the Danishes, with the call. The coffee's expensive. Why don't you do this? Radical. We're going to give it away. We're going to give you. We're going to extend the fellowship of hospital. We're going to say to our neighbor, it is our good purpose to please our neighbor as they walk into the door. And our neighbor may or may not know what they're even walking into, but they're going to recognize, wow, they got good coffee. <laughs> I just thought of something. I had a guy tell me several years ago that they came to Hillsdale because we had premium toilet paper in the bathrooms. <laughs> Is that not radical hospitality? <laughs> That's what we, but you know, here's the more important thing. We can do all of these things, right? We can, we can adopt these practical practices. But just like that song that uh, Noah sang a while ago, where the Spirit of the Lord is, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is love. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I can't tell you the number of times over the course of our ministry that people come to me, 
people who have come here and they say to me, and they're usually just neighbors, don't even understand what they, they don't quite know yet what they don't know. I don't know what it is about Hillsdale, but there's something special going on there. Do you know what that is, church? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is love, there is peace. What people experience in the form of radical hospitality is the Spirit of the Lord living in you and living out through you. And I will say to you, that comes across in a myriad of different ways. Loving all people is one way that it comes out. We don't judge people. We don't close the door to certain people. This is a place where that inward and spiritual grace is extended in radical hospitality. Passionate worship. We worship God. This is the point. The point of the church is to come together in a common life of praise and worship. And you do that well. What, what I think we learn, now sometimes this is a hard thing to navigate. Um, some people come for a different kind of attraction. They like the music. They like the coffee. They like the comfort of the chair. They like coming as they are. They don't like to get dressed. You know, so people have different motivations of what attracts them. But here is the most important thing about the common life that we share. We come together. The point being, we come together to praise and worship the living God. Not some cultural deity locally manifest by some other means. What we're saying when we come in here and worship, you, you know what, you're not the audience. You might think, you may be confused and think, I'm the audience. I've heard people say, I didn't really like the sermon." It's not about that. It's not about you. <laughs> You're not the audience. Who is the audience in worship? God is the audience. You are here to passionately worship God. It has little to nothing to do with me, with the worship team, with the setting, with the coffee. It has everything, the point is it has everything to do with the common life of praise and worship to the one God, Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's why we're here. It takes some people a long time to realize that's why we're here. Passionate worship, intentional faith development. Let me just say, I, I need to stop there. I'm running out of time, but... Intentional faith development, this, this COVID mess has really messed us up. Because what I feel like with this particular practice, fruitful practice, the door has been closed. Has it not? It is hard to be in intentional faith development. I, I can't Zoom. I mean, I can, but the whole time I'm thinking, am I on? Am I off? Am I recording? Am I not? I don't even, you know, I, I, I do everything on my phone so I can't see everybody. It's usually me and one other person. And I'm thinking the whole time, boy, I look fat. And I'm thinking, is that the way I really look? <laughs> I don't do that in Bible study. <laughs> I, I don't do that with you. This I, don't, I might be fat, but I don't worry about it. That Zooming stuff is just hard. So the door, you know, here's what I believe. That radical hospitality, that invitation to our neighbor is the front door, the middle door of our life, the middle door of our faith and practice is this intentional faith development. I have, it's been a whole year since I've sat down with a group of people and taught the Bible in person. And I grieve that. 
And we got to get back to it. We got to get back to it soon. So that's a door that's been, this next one, risk taking mission and service. Oh my goodness. I have never been a part of a fellowship of believers like Hillsdale, never in my life. And I have been around some mighty fine churches, but I have never witnessed risk-taking mission and service like you guys do, which you guys faithfully honor God with. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about how in the early stages of, of my leadership here, we moved from random acts of kindness to the food ministry, manna meals, the soup trailer, heavenly bags. If you don't know, if you have not experienced that risk-taking mission and service, sign up, for goodness sake. Get involved. We go every single week with boatloads of foods, food in various forms to various people making connections with our neighbors. And the, the last one, that extravagant generosity, is, is it's kind of all rolled up in the same thing there. We give. We give faithfully. And I've never been a part of a congregation that gave itself away with such generosity and with such intentionality. We make sure that we don't keep our hands on it. We make sure that we give it away. That's being extravagant. We don't have any CDs. <laughs> we don't have any stocks tucked away for a rainy day. We give it away for our neighbor, to please our neighbor, so that our neighbor will come to know the glory of God. We don't do it for ourselves. Jesus didn't do it for himself. That's what Paul said. Jesus did it for the neighbor. You know, I firmly believe, and if you've been around Hillsdale before, you've heard me say this. We who know God, we who have accepted Christ, we who have the Holy Spirit living in us, beam us up, God. We're ready. We're ready to go home. We're ready to be with you. You know why we're not? The point is that God is leaving us here to build. To build and to embrace a common life together in worship and praise that includes all of these things that we do in his name to give God the glory. That's the only reason we're left here. That's the only real work that we have before us to love our neighbor, to love all our neighbors, and to love one another into a relationship with Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. receive this benediction go in the love and peace and presence of our Lord and Savior and may we continue with all that we have 
to love one another and to be of one voice to the glory of God. And all God's people said,